On the podcast today, my second in a month-long look at previous Broadway seasons. And the guest today is composer and lyricist Andrew Lippa. He's been nominated for Tony and Drama Desk Awards and won the Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Music for The Wild Party. We talk about that music all the way through to his most recent work on a Tiger King parody musical. I'm your host, Patrick Oliver-Jones, and this is Why I'll Never Make It. Ultimately, I carry around the voices of of people, uh, of feeling like people don't believe in me or don't want to support me or don't think I have any talent. It's really my own voice. Well, thanks for coming and joining me on the podcast once again, where we feature conversations with artists talking about the realities of a career in the entertainment industry. To contact me and learn more about the podcast, That website is winmepodcast.com. Back in 2011, I landed my first national tour with The Addams Family. The previous year, I had made my off-Broadway debut, so this felt like the next step, the next level, and I was so excited to be joining the cast. Little did I know that the touring version of The Addams Family was going to be a chance for Andrew Lippa and the writing team to revamp a lot of what the Broadway show had become. This was their chance to see what had worked and not worked with the Broadway run and then rewrite it in such a way to make the national tour a slightly different but hopefully better production. One of my favorite memories from the rehearsal period is when we were all called in to the rehearsal room, chairs were set up and we all sat down, and Andrew Lippa had come in with a new song for Gomez. Our music supervisor, Mary Mitchell Campbell, sat down at the piano and accompanied Andrew Lippa singing that song to us to give us a taste of what it was going to be. I I was speechless, and it is one of the highlights of my performing career to be in a room and hear a song that no one had heard before. It was a a really special moment. Now, that song, it kind of got cut up in parts, and part of it went to this one song, part of it went to another song, which makes it even more special that we got to hear it in its original form during that rehearsal process. And so on today's episode, that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about, what it takes to write a musical, Andrew Lippa's process for doing that, and we go through The Wild Party, Adam's Family, of course, and Big Fish. He shares some of the disappointments that he's had in the reception of some of those musicals, namely The Wild Party and Big Fish. But he also talks about the things that he learned about the business through writing and working on The Addams Family. Then we get into some of his other works that he's done since Big Fish. And we end the episode today with your questions. All right, Mr. Andrew Lippa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Or rather, being there in Ohio. <laughs> now, well, it's how the new, It's the new here. R- right, right. It's wherever Zoom can go, that's where the new here is, yes. yes. And how long have you been in Ohio? I have lived in... I, I live in Manhattan. I have an apartment in Manhattan. Uh, and I'm in New York about once, well, you know, under normal circumstances, I'm in New York for about a week, a month. And then the rest of the time, I am in Columbus, Ohio, and have been here since uh, mid-2017. And, uh, and then I'm in Los Angeles about once every two months. So I move around a lot. Yeah. But fortunately for your line of work, uh, your writing can kind of go with you wherever you go. Absolutely. The writing and or collaborating with collaborators, sometimes it's good to be in the room. And, and so in terms of musicals, I'm working on three musicals at the moment. One of them I'm writing by myself, one with a colleague in LA and one with a colleague in London. Mm. So being in the New York area is the middle, the middle spot in between those two extremes. And uh, so I will travel one way or the other when we have to be together or my colleagues will travel to where I am. And, but a lot of the time because of Zoom and or um, just being on the phone, sharing stuff digitally, it's, it's easy to write from anywhere now. Because for most of your work, especially in musical theater, it's been about collaboration, whether it's uh, book writers, lyricists, and other creatives in the room. But when it comes to, like, for example, The Wild Party, you were it. You wrote the book, the lyrics, the music, everything. 
How was that different from your other collaborative processes? The Wild Party came into my life um, when my first musical, John and Jen, that I co-wrote with uh, Tom Greenwald, uh, was still playing in New York in the summer of 1995. And I discovered the poem, The Wild Party, in a newly published edition that Art Spiegelman, the great uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author and illustrator, had uh, published with new drawings. And the drawings were very compelling, as was the poem. And uh, Tom Greenwald didn't want to work on The Wild Party with me. Uh, I just didn't inspire him in the way it did me. And I remember thinking at the end of 1995, no one's going to ask me to write a musical and nobody cares if I write a musical. So it's really up to me. If I want to do something, I've got to put my full uh, commitment behind it. And I remember I started writing in the early, early, early days of 1996 and was so deeply passionate about uh, those characters in that story. And there was something in my life that was reflective of what was going on in that poem. And um, I dug as deeply as I could. I had never written music and lyrics for a whole musical before. And I didn't know any playwrights and I didn't want that to be an impediment. Um, I didn't want to be the person who went around going, well, I have this great idea, but I can't find anybody to work on it with me. I thought as I had done in, in my, other creative endeavors in my life in much smaller ways, I felt, you know, I'll do it. You know, why not? Like, it felt one of those, it was one of those, what do you got to lose kind of things. Um, And, or or the Woody Allen quote, if we're allowed to still quote Woody Allen, which some people would say we're probably not, um, but I'm going to anyway, um, which was the, the quote is, the only thing standing between greatness and me is me. And, Um, And that's an inspiring quote to me because I don't know that I've ever achieved greatness, but I certainly won't achieve greatness if I don't do something. Um, I remember uh, I trained and participated in a Tough Mudder in 2012, which is a really incredible, it's like a Spartan race. It's an incredibly difficult uh, multiple obstacle course race with 5,000 people over 21 obstacles and like Navy SEAL style obstacles where you just submerge yourself in ice water and all sorts of really insane things. And Sounds exhausting. I, uh, it was amazing. It was the only time I've ever participated in something like that. And I did it at 46 and I really wanted a pre, like could do something like that. And while I was training for it, I went to a, a, a really hilarious in a basement gym with a lot of really intense people. And there were posters all over the wall, inspirational posters, like the the workout equivalent of hanging there, it's Friday, uh, you know, Friday's coming, the kitty on the branch. And um, one of them said, uh, that really stuck with me, people will not always believe what you say, but they will always believe what you do. That quote, I had never heard before, and it has really, really guided my life because any number of people might sit might say, I'm gonna write the great American novel, but don't. And uh, don't even write the novel, they don't get started. So I think I had a bit of that in me in 1996 um, that said, just, you know, build it and they will come. And, uh, and I did, and they did. And so it turned out to be a rewarding experience because I made something I cared about, I got people interested in it and we got it to happen. And um, so I'm, uh, and I vowed after that experience, it was so challenging to write a piece all by myself that I said I would never do it again. And now of course I'm doing exactly that. (laughs) (laughs) You're doing a lot of that, yeah. Now, was it disappointing that your wild party didn't eventually make it to Broadway? Was that ever even a goal? Um, It wasn't a, it wasn't specifically uh, what the goal was of the production. But it was disappointing that it didn't that it didn't go to Broadway and get the kind of attention a Broadway show can get, um, and certainly get the opportunity to be as successful as it might have been. Although who knows? Who knows? It could have closed in a month, and the show has lived on in its recording and in multiple productions around the world in multiple languages. I read a, I read a, a review of a production somewhere I don't remember where somewhere in the U.S. and the the writer like the show very much but um the 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 whole notion of the of the review was you know this isn't the show for your grandma and how you know like the show is the show is really intense and the show is really uh pisses people off 
And I thought, wow, 20 years after its premiere, I'm still pissing people off with something I wrote 20 years, you know, that was premiered 20 years ago. I started writing it 25 years ago. And wow, that's, for me, that's a, that's a victory because it, has, it means it hasn't aged out. It felt relevant to the people who, had, who were talking about it. And in fact, unfortunately, and I can't say yet because it'll probably, it'll get moved, I hope, but we were meant to do a rather significant production of it this autumn. And uh, my hunch is that's all going to be scuttled. Yeah, a lot of schedules are moving forward yeah. and further into the future these days. Yeah, so who knows? You know, the, the, the joy of making musicals in part is uh, I, I get to own or co-own them. Um, and therefore th get the joy of redoing them. Uh, you know, we did the 2015 production at City Center with Sutton Foster and Steve Pasquale and Brandon Victor Dixon. Uh, you know, what an amazing group of people we got to work with. And that was a, a thrill to revisit the show and to share it with 13,000 people over five performances who really embraced it. And, uh, and we will, I think, if God willing, I live long enough, I will see that again yeah. and see people embrace it again. So it's a fun thing to keep going back to. Now, with your shows after Wild Party, they were mostly based upon pre-existing, more popular material. You know, Charlie Brown, Adam's Family, Big Fish. They were, you know, cartoons, TV shows, movies. Were there added responsibilities and pressures that came with taking on such well-known properties? Uh, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll address all of those. Charlie Brown actually predated the Wild Party. Uh, I started working on the Wild Party before Charlie Brown came along, but Charlie Brown happened before the wild party happened and um charlie brown was an odd situation uh, or or less pressured situation because i came in to work on an existing show to uh somehow dust it off a little bit gussy it up a little bit uh in terms of arrangements and presentation of the material and uh ended up writing three new songs one of them being my new philosophy which kristen chenoweth uh hit, hit a grand slam with every time she she performed it anywhere and so um that was a joyful, wonderful experience from beginning to end, uh, making that show and being seen as someone who had come into, uh, uh, you know, uh, nobody blamed me, as it were, yeah. for, uh, for, you know, if they didn't like it or if it wasn't what they wanted it to be. They, they, I got a lot of good reaction from that show. Adam's Family is the, um, the most extraordinary uh, blessing in my career uh, in so far as I simply got asked if I wanted to do it. I simply said yes. I had to meet a few people and everybody got along at coffee and that was that. And uh, within, you know, three years of not even three years of the time that I got asked to do it, we were in production uh, in, for our Chicago tryout before we went to Broadway. Which is a quick turnaround in musical theater. It's an incredibly quick turnaround, especially for a $15 million show. Um, and uh, the Adams Family... Um, there was a, a, a really generous article in the New York Times just a, a few weeks ago uh, about how uh, the headline of, of that article was uh, the Adams Family was panned and, in New York and then it became a hit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, um, that's the order you'd like to see it. And uh, it's certainly the truth of the show. The show uh, went through many changes both prior to Broadway and after Broadway for the national tour, as well you know. Right. Uh, at the end of the national tour, we had a show that we really loved and was the show that we'd always hoped we would make. We, it just took a little longer than the amount of time we had between the time we started and the time we opened on Broadway. And we were lucky we were able to rewrite the show. And, and that version is the one that gets done all over the world and has been seen by 37 million people and has it been the most produced musical in North America for the last five years. Wow. And when it wasn't the most produced, it was number two. And so we, uh, who knows what it will be uh, now because uh, we're all taking a break. And uh, I don't know that licensing of musicals will come back to life for a good, probably a year or so. Yeah. Um, and uh, we will see what happens. But there's been a lot of, uh, incredible number of international productions and writing that show was a big challenge in so far as there was a lot of money there was a lot of famous people um, I was the new kid on the block uh, it was I was seen somehow I don't know why but as a more of a sort of indie indie downtown artist I think the Wild Party had something to do with that and I 
was working in this, you know, mainstream world. And we were also working with characters who everybody who came to see the show thought they knew. <laughs> and what I mean by that is everybody comes in with their slightly different version or their different prejudice or preference for a particular character or set of characters and how they ought to behave. And you can't please everyone, of course. And we um, learned a lot as we went along about how to uh, tell the audience. Uh, no more no more evidence than in the opening number. The opening number in Chicago was a, a very different number from the one we, we had on Broadway. And the one, what we realized in between Chicago and Broadway was, you know what the audience wants? This is what they want. They want, they want to meet the people they know. And we realized that what I needed to write was a, this is who we are, this is what we do kind of opening number, which is comedy tonight or in the height or tradition. Um, those numbers where the characters come forward and say, this is who we are, this is what we do. We're not gonna bother you with story. We're just gonna tell you about the world and who we are. And so I wrote, when you're in Adams, that turned out to be the biggest, best change because not only did that number really land, but um, the, um, we realized that the famous music from the TV show, which we thought we were being clever, we buried it in the show at 20 minutes in. <laughs> um, and then we revealed it. And I was like, woohoo, here it is. They, um, no, the audience wanted that. Da -da -da -da, snap, snap. They, that's what they came for. That's what they paid their that's money for. That's all they for. wanted to hear, yeah. That is what <laughs> they wanted. We were awake enough, I think. It's, you know, some, some artists would be. Screw you, we're going to do our own thing. And, and we would recognize that, you know, it's a, it's a dialogue in a show with famous characters. Uh, we have to think about what the audience is expecting to see. And we ended up putting in that famous music at the beginning. And what it did was subconsciously it said to the audience, hey, we know why you're here. We got gotcha. you. So we're going to give you that famous music. And then Nathan Lane is going to talk to you. And... God bless Nathan Lane because he really was the glue that held the show together. And he was also, um, he has this, like any star, has this unique contract with the audience. They think they know him. So it was a really interesting hat on a hat because they think they knew Gomez and they think they know Nathan. And Nathan got to come out and amalgamate those, those, uh, those things and say, I am this character now. I am this actor you love. Let's go through this together. And that really sealed a, a kind of um, pact you make with an audience that said, we got you. And we got that right on Broadway. And, and the rest of the things we changed were in relation to what we had learned that we got right. And with regards to Big Fish, that being a, a movie, was that that same process of trying to distill what people thought they knew from the movie into a stage form? I think show people think that uh, Big Fish is more well-known than it actually was. Big Fish was a, a moderate success as a movie and more of a culty following. Uh, it's, you know, people, people who loved it loved it. And, um, but we didn't feel burdened. Even John August, who wrote the movie and wrote the musical with me, John August did not feel burdened by what he thought the audience knew or didn't know about these characters because that movie had been, like I said, a, a moderate success, not a cultural imprint like the Adams Family characters. The challenge of making a Spider-Man musical or, you know, something that, at that level of how much the audience really knows these characters. Mm -hmm. Um, so we never, we never felt that pressure uh, in Big Fish and we felt the pressure to tell the story in the most magical way possible. And the show, if anything, the show, um, we, we gained so many supporters along the way and each time we gained supporters, the show got a little bigger. And I think the show getting bigger may not have been what it ultimately wanted to be from when John and I started writing it. And in fact, since, since then, when we've done productions in London and recently Scott Schwartz, who runs the Bay Street Theater in Sag Harbor, New York, um, Scott just directed an extraordinary production in Seoul, Korea. And that production uh, was scheduled again, here we go, but it was scheduled to go out again as a tour in Korea this fall. Uh, perhaps it will happen next year, but um, he, um, scaled it down in, in a certain way 
that uh, just allowed it to feel a bit more, a bit more immediate, a bit more human. And and sort of the our town version of Big Fish is is um, more more what John and I uh, see for the future of that show rather than something like a big, big, splashy Broadway musical. Although that's not to say we didn't enjoy and take part in and approve all of the things that we did for Broadway because at the time it felt exciting to do these fantasy sequences as huge, mm-hmm. as huge as possible and then make the human moments as human as possible. That felt like the right idea. But I think in the end, it may have been we may have gone too far in the big category. So it sounds like that Big Fish, maybe as it progressed and, and went along, that someone lost its way, perhaps maybe lost the, the direction that you had in, in mind. Do you think that was a reason why it just didn't seem to connect with audiences as much as Adam's family? No, I think the challenge of Big Fish was not... Um, uh, the band's visit is a beautiful show. And the band's visit had a small cast and um, and therefore it was less expensive to run. Our show was very expensive to run and um, didn't have the benefit of a super famous title and didn't have the benefit, I had great theater actors, wonderful. Uh, Norbert Leo Butts is, is the best there is, mm-hmm. and it attracted uh, it attracted people who loved theater and loved uh, the ca- our cast, but it didn't um, have long enough to build or generate an audience. It didn't make a, it didn't reach deep enough into the audience quickly enough. It may have to do with it's difficult to describe what the show's about, and that we could never the marketing never quite figured it out, and that's an important part of selling a big show. Um, it, Big Fish could be about, oh, it's about a father and a son and the imagination the father has and, the, and this wonderful relationship between the two of them. But you could also talk about it at work the next day and say, well, it's about this guy who has cancer and he lies to his son all his life. And then at the end, he dies and he makes up with his son. You know, it's like, I don't want to spend one hundred fifty dollars to go see that. That does not sound like fun. And so it is about how you position. Like if you describe Cabaret, the musical Cabaret, you said, well, it's about the, this woman who decides to stay in Nazi Germany and like she doesn't care if she dies because she's having a good time. Like, <laughs> I don't know that you'd go, you know, and and but I think whatever it was about Cabaret that people say, it, it, it's the songs are amazing and they put on this show in the Cabaret and it's so funny and, you know, that people will go. So it's it's really, I think that was a part of, of what happened with Big Fish. Now, you haven't been back on Broadway with the show since Big Fish. Now, obviously, you've stayed busy, but did Big Fish's quote-unquote lack of success, did that have anything to do with that, or you've just gone in other directions yourself creatively? I had three, I had three shows that I was working on in that period of time. Um, major projects for me. One was The Adams Family, one was Big Fish, and one was my musical, The Man in the Ceiling, which I wrote uh, with Jules Pfeiffer, the great um, artist and and writer. The Man in the Ceiling was a show that we uh, had hoped would have some sort of New York production. It uh, went to Bay Street Theater, as I mentioned, that theater earlier in 2017, and the recording came out in 2019, but uh, it never found its way to New York yet. And so that show, uh, I got, was two out of three is basically, you know, how I look at that period of time. And during that period of time, really 2009 to 2019, I also wrote I Am Harvey Milk, which was a, has been a major success for me in uh, not a Broadway musical, but a big concert work that gets done all over the world. And I wrote a follow-up piece for that called I Am Ann Hutchinson and paired it up with I Am R.V. Milk, and we have plans to do that, those two as a, as a piece of theater. And I wrote another big choral work called Unbreakable, and uh, all of those, um, with, with the exception of Ann Hutchinson, I Am R.V. Milk and Unbreakable are recorded, all related to my association with the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. What is it that drew you to the, the two projects, Harvey Milk and Unbreakable, uh, specifically to work with the Gay Men's Chorus? I got an email uh, at the end of 2011. 2011 had been a rough emotional year for me uh, in, um, I ha- had a lot of a lot of uh, painful things and a lot of growth in 2011. And near the end of that year, I got an email 
um, as such things uh, hopefully do in your life when you come out or through the tunnel of sad things. Um, I got an email from Tim Seelig, who is the music director, or then was the relatively newly appointed music director of the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, telling me that they had reached out uh, to about 10 different writers, or they were planning to reach out to about 10 different writers, uh, songwriters, and asking us to uh, write a five minute piece uh, based on our observations of, or, or feelings about uh, Harvey Milk. And I called Tim when I got that email, and I said, I would like to do this, but I would, uh, like to write the whole thing. I'd like to write a full length work myself. We talked about why, talked about my kindred sense of Harvey Milk. Harvey Milk was um, 48 when he was assassinated. And when this piece was meant to be premiered, I would be 48. He was Jewish, I'm Jewish. He lived most of his life in New York. I've lived most of my life in New York. He came to politics late in his career. I've come to my political uh, uh, sense of activism and, and political life late in my life. Um, he was used to work in the theater. Uh, he worked on the original production of Jesus Christ Superstar. He was like an assistant stage manager, or I can't remember the job that he had, um, or assistant to the director or something like that. And, uh, and so I had a lot of feelings about Harvey Milk that felt like, oh, I, I can relate to this man. Uh, Tim said there were about 10 other choruses across the country that were doing this as a co-commission. They had to discuss it and they'd get back to me. About a week later, he did said, we want you to write this. And I, I set forth and wrote this uh, big 60 minute work called I Am Harvey Milk. Uh, and we premiered it uh, in June of 2013. Uh, it was actually the very day that the Defense of Marriage Act and uh, Proposition 8, the hideous proposition that had passed in California in 2008, uh, making gay marriage illegal, um, had, um, been uh, struck down by the Supreme Court of the United States. And the, the day that DOMA and Prop 8 were struck down, that morning, that night, we premiered I Am Harvey Milk in front of 1,500 people, two blocks away from where George Moscone, the mayor, and Harvey Milk had been gunned down in cold blood. It was extraordinary. And of course, if, if, you, if you believe nothing is coincidental, as I do, uh, something larger at, in play, it felt like to me. And, and I got to play Harvey Milk. So that was another thing where I got to bring my performing self into my work. Which I think is something that a lot of people don't know about you, that, you know, you're not just this composer, lyricist, writer. You also perform and you've gotten a chance to do a lot of that. Obviously, you talked about a lot of your personal connections with Harvey Milk. Was that what led you to be like, I'm the one who needs to then perform this. In the winter, in the beginning of the winter in 2013, I put together um, a, a, a two or three day thing with a group of singers and actors and just to show the, to the piece to some friends and supporters and Tim flew in from San Francisco to see it. And um, I played Harvey Milk uh, at the time because Tim and I had talked six months prior who should play Harvey Milk and we were batting around ideas about who should do that. and. He said, well, everybody here, meaning his music staff, and I had sent them my demos, me singing the demos. Everybody here thinks you should do it. And I'm like, well, I don't want this to be I am Andrew Lippa. I want this to be about Harvey Milk, and I don't want to take that away from it. And, he's, and when I came up with this notion of putting on our own little uh, presentation, I said, why don't I do it for the presentation, and let's use that as my audition. And everybody thought that was a good idea. So I did that little presentation we did in New York. And that was in Bruce Cohen, my friend and frequent colleague on projects who co-produced Big Fish and uh, has produced many successful movies, TV shows, and, and theater. Uh, Bruce was in the room as well. And Bruce came up to me and said, I must be involved. I want to co-produce this. Please, please, please introduce me to the San Francisco Game Men's Chorus people. And that's when that relationship got started. And we've since done a number of things together as a group. And... So uh, that was a successful day. That was when the orchestra, which was originally going to be 12 pieces, became 27. And we recorded it. Uh, the great Leslie Ann Jones, who runs Skywalker Sound, she recorded it. And uh, we did three performances uh, in this hall where the room was electrified uh, because they were San Franciscans, many of whom had lived through this period and knew this, knew this history. I was 13 in 1978, but anybody older than me uh, you know, five, anybody five years older than me um, had, uh, many of them had moved when, the, you know, high school ended and they went to San Francisco. That's what people, a lot of people did and a lot of gay people did. It, uh, it has just been a remarkable thing. We premiered it in New York at Lincoln Center with Kristen Chenoweth and the Orchestra of St. Luke's. And uh, 
Uh, and then in 2016 at the Music Center of Strathmore in North Bethesda, we added I Am Anne Hutchinson. Again, just extraordinarily well received in a great review in the Washington Post, a great review in Opera News. Um, and Kristen Chenoweth and I got to play opposite good guy, bad guys. Uh, it was really fun. She played Anne Hutchinson in the first piece and I played Governor John Winthrop, who was her nemesis. And then in the second act, I play Harvey Milk and she plays this amalgam of women characters who are sometimes his nemesis and sometimes his uh, supporter. Uh, we're, I'm, we're working on trying to get a version of this that is manageable as a theater piece. It's right now, we've done it with hundreds of people. Uh, we did I Am Harvey Milk in Denver in 2016 with 750 people. Oh my. And uh, wow. in, front, in front of 5,000 people. So it, it has the capacity to certainly be big. And uh, we're trying to see if we can do it with a smaller group of people and uh, therefore put it on the stage and do, do it as a piece of theater. Yeah, and it's not just Harvey Milk, but uh, but you had mentioned The Man in the Ceiling. You also performed in that at that Bay Street production. You played the role of Uncle Lester, and you had written an article for Playbill when you were talking about the, the cast recording and the songs themselves, and you mentioned that uh, you could replace the name Andrew Lippo for Uncle Lester. What is it about that role that's so personal to you? It wasn't a great stretch as an actor, I must say. Uh, it was about a guy who... Uh, who had devoted his life to writing musicals, uh, in his case, uh, rather unsuccessfully. I'm grateful I've had a little bit of, of support and success in my life. But he uh, had reached a point where he moved in with his sister. Uh, I have a, a sister. And, um, and he uh, wrote songs in the attic at his, living in his sister's house and didn't get along with his brother-in-law. And, they are no, and the brother-in-law didn't believe in him. My brother-in-law and I have a great relationship and he's always been very supportive. Um, but ultimately I carry around the voices of, of people, uh, of feeling like people don't believe in me or don't want to support me or don't think I have any talent. It's really my own voice telling me I suck and uh, me having to constantly push back at it and saying, you know, you sit in the corner, you sit over there, I'm going to do my thing. And uh, uh, that thing I've learned at, at some point, uh, I hope everyone learns it, which is, God, there's so many people out there who really do want to tell me I suck. I don't need to be one of them. Right. So Uncle Lester writes musicals and um, reaches a point where he writes something truly spectacularly good and believes, um, as, as do all of the people around him, that it's going to be a great success for him and make his name and make his fortune. And he ends up just destroyed, eviscerated in the press, and it rips his heart out. And uh, I have had this feeling, I have experienced this, um, quite literally that very thing, writing, writing something that I believed in and that other people around me believed in, not just my mother, but people of the theater, people with the capacity to help make it into something successful. Um, and uh, Is there a particular show that, that is personal to you as far as the criticism you received? Oh, The Wild Party, unquestionable. Um, that that has to do with it being the first and, um, and that I wrote it by myself and, and that there was this manic energy around the wild party during previews. Like Michael Eisner, the head of the Walt Disney Corporation came and Bette Midler came and Marvin Hamlish came and like all these people came to the Manhattan Theater Club's 300 seat space. And because they had heard it was this great thing. And then we ended up not getting the kind of reviews we had hoped for. Um, and there was another wild party on going to Broadway. And it just, there was no way for us, it just never materialized. So we did a show, it ran for 11 weeks and got recorded and that was that. It was like, thanks, you know, next. And so I was left for a good while uh, really sad. And I will tell you, um, I, I know one of the questions you're going to ask me is um, uh, what advice have I ever gotten that, uh, that is uh, profound or useful? And I'm going to answer it now. Okay. Um, I remember John Kander and Fred Ebb, who uh, made Freddie rest in peace. And, and John and Fred, um, some years later, uh, they wrote a uh, a book with uh, an author whose name I, uh, escapes me at the moment called Colored Lights, which is based on a song title of theirs. 
And it's an interview with John and Fred about their career. And there are two pages in this book where they talk about having seen the wild party. And Fred, uh, Freddie said in the book, at the end uh, of the wild party, he said, it, it wasn't that I wanted to know Andrew Lippa or something like that. He said, I wanted to be Andrew Lippa. Hmm. And when I saw that quote, I was like, are you kidding me? And I called him and we talked for quite a while. And, and he said, that's what it made me feel like. It made me feel like, oh my God, how, how, I, I wish I had done that. And John, that was some years after, but right after we opened about two or three weeks later, John called me and asked me how I was doing. And he did that sort of fatherly, how are you doing kid? And I couldn't be honest with him. And I said, I lied. Oh, I'm great. Uh, you know, so many people are coming to the show and we're making a recording and it got extended by a week. And, you know, this is a guy who'd been through the process of making shows many times and been through the disappointment of shows many times, as well as the, the exultant highs of successful shows. Right. And John said, you know what? You're going to write a masterpiece. And the wild party may be it. And they are going to shit all over you. And you know what? You'll write something else. And it'll be good because you're good. But you'll know it's not the best thing you've ever done. And that's the one that will make your name and make your fortune. Hmm. And you know what? From show to show, you have no fucking clue which one it's going to be. So just go write another one, okay? And you can see in my face, I still feel that from 20 years ago, that, that, that thing that John said to me. And how that was followed up not many months later by a call from Arthur Lawrence uh, asking me to write music and a song for a play he was doing at the George Street Playhouse. And I went over to Arthur's house. This was in the fall of that same year of 2000. And I went over to Arthur at a beautiful brownstone in the village. And we went into his dining room and we sat pretty much knee to knee in two different chairs facing each other. And he started going, you know, Arthur was famously, uh, uh, famously uh, told the truth as he saw it uh, and, uh, and didn't, didn't really with, withhold. And he goes, I saw that other wild party and I won't go into what his opinion of it, but it wasn't favorable. And he said, and I could have told you, I read that poem. I could have told you it's a terrible idea for a musical. And he finished the rant. And I said, mm -hmm. well, and I had never met him before. Well, that's not true. I had met him. I was on the receiving end of criticism at the ASCAP workshop many years prior. And he, and he eviscerated me in front of a bunch of people. And, and he didn't remember that he had done that. And here he was asking me to write the score for a play that he wrote. And I'm like, oh, how the worm doth turn. <laughs> but he said, I read that poem and I could have told you it, it's a terrible idea for a musical. And there was a pause and I said, well, Arthur, say what you will. But The Wild Party turned me into a lyricist and composer in the theater. And The Wild Party catapulted me into the front ranks of people my age making musicals. And, you know, come to think of it, The Wild Party is the reason I'm sitting across from you right now. So from where I sit, it was a fucking great idea. And he looked at me with his Cheshire cat grin and he lifted his hand with his index finger, wagging in the air for about, I felt like 10 seconds with this grin on his face. And I will tell you the, the ensuing 11 years, I would call him, he would call me, I would see him, we would talk. He asked me to write a musical with him, which thank God never materialized, but we were pals. And, and we were pals because I found the way in the moment to say, 
fuck you. It was a great idea for me. Fuck you. And, but I made it about him. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget it because I will tell you this, all these years later, my relationship with Arthur continues because I am writing the book, Music and Lyrics, to a musical version of The Turning Point, which is Arthur's film that he oh, wrote, starring right. Shirley MacLaine and Anne Bancroft. Um, and I, I look at Arthur as my, uh, my posthumous collaborator um, because he, when I write and work on the show, he is there with me and his story and his characters and the screenplay on which it's based are my constant companions. And I feel like I, when I get stuck in any way, I ask Arthur what to do. And, and I feel I have this connection with him from the beyond, as, as silly as that sounds. Um, and I'm so grateful that I didn't cower because that's not, that isn't me anyway, but I, I didn't cower. And, and, and I learned a great lesson from Arthur, which is how um, I have a right to stand up for what I, for what I made and for what I believe in. So mm -hmm. those, those greats, the, the power of that kind of mentoring from the people who have, have made the things and been involved in things that I want to be involved with, um, really, I've met all of them and, and they've all, all of them have offered me um, wonderful, wonderful advice through the years. Uh, but those two in particular, John, John and, and Arthur, the, that year really, really profoundly impacted my life. As Andrew mentioned, we'll be doing those final five questions where I ask him about best advice in the next episode. But for now, I want to end today's episode with your questions. A couple of weeks ago, before Andrew and I sat down to record this episode, I reached out on Instagram and asked for your questions about what you would like to ask him. And thankfully, I got a good response and a good variety of questions about his work. A lot of the questions that you asked I covered in our conversation today throughout the episode, but there were four questions and comments that stuck out, and so I wanted to pose those to Andrew. Well, I did have a few listener questions, and, and the first few deal with Wild Party. Um, sure. Brian, he wrote, he just wanted to say that, uh, tell him how much I love the Wild Party and wishing for a revival soon. So, you know, the, the show lives on and still still is uh, is sought after. Tell him we hope to grant his wish. Yes, yes, we, we all hope that. Uh, Claire had uh, a question. What are your thoughts on the Lacusa Wild Party? We developed the Wild Party in 1997 at the O'Neill and uh, had a wonderful transformative experience there where, the, where it, it really, the show came into view and that's when Jeffrey Seller and Kevin McCollum uh, came on board as the commercial producers and when the Manhattan Theatre Club got interested in producing it. Um, and I didn't find out uh, that uh, Michael John and George Wolf were making a version until sometime late in 1998. And at that point, uh, MTC and Jeffrey and Kevin had made a commitment to working on our show. And, and they said, You're, you know, we're, we're doing your show. Like, that's the show we're doing. Let's go. Let's make it as good as we can. So um, it really... It didn't, it didn't have any effect on us. We still did our show and we did it exactly as we would have done it with or without the other show. And, and there's an argument to be made that said we might not have gotten as much attention had there not been the other show. So mm -hmm. um, there may, you know, the, the, blessings may, the blessing may have been that there were two. <laughs> uh, and Clay asked, what show has taught you the most and how have you gotten better over the years? Wow. Uh, I don't know if there's a show that's taught me the most. Uh, I think I learned the most about how to um, navigate business and art, but through the Adams family. Like mm -hmm. that's um, that was a, a a challenging experience, and uh, and and I think I always feel like a beginner every time I start. Um, and I think my, I've been willing, I think my willingness grows to seek out um, advice and uh, to ask people what they think and be willing to listen when I'm developing a show. I used to keep things very close to the best and not want to hear what people really thought. Uh, I, it would be, it would feel hurtful to me to get 
honest feedback. I don't know. We just saw Little Women, and there's that wonderful scene where Saoirse Ronan gets really mad at the uh, the man whose character I can't remember who she ultimately marries, but he gives her quote honest feedback about her writing and says that it's not very good. And he says, "I would only I only tell you this because I think you're very talented." And she just couldn't accept that. I was like that early on. I I, I couldn't accept that you thought I was talented, but you didn't like what I did. Like how how is that possible? And now I can see someone can say this isn't this doesn't accomplish what you think it should accomplish, and here's why. And I'm like, huh? And it will really make me think and and rethink. So I, I think I'm getting better at that. And our last listener question, uh, which is actually something I wanted to end on, is how do you turn a TV series like Tiger King into a musical? Well, what's hilarious about Tiger King is that I floated this ridiculous notion that I was going to turn it into a musical, um, forgetting that people might have actually taken me seriously. And um, <laughs> Yeah, because you created an entire like Twitter uh, feed just based upon the Tiger Cubs. I, 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 I've taken on this persona on Twitter of, of, the, of the nut job who was going to make Tiger King into a musical. <laughs> and uh, what's, what's been extraordinary, again, it goes back to what I was talking about when I was starting the wild party about committing to something and saying, I'm gonna do this and you will come with me, you will follow me. And um, this is uh, the Tiger King thing, the number of calls, um, the number of people who wanna get involved, the number of people who keep going, well, maybe it is a thing, or is it a movie? Or should we be doing it as an animated movie? Or, and, and like, it's just so silly. Um, that it's been absolutely joyful. So am I turning it into a musical? I don't know. I certainly don't have the right to turn it into a musical based on the Netflix TV show. Um, So um, no. Uh, Am I allowed to make a parody? Yes, I am. And are we gonna have some new songs for you soon? Yes, we will. So (laughs) stay tuned. Ever since I was an itty bitty thing, I could always keep them in control. Christy and I have this very, very special friendship, and uh, um, uh, there might be something else coming your way for me and Christy that I'm not going to tip the boat here. But um, we're happily uh, cooking up a few new things, so that's a good thing. Thank you so much for joining me and Andrew today on the podcast. To find out more about his work, as well as follow him on social media, you'll see those links in the show notes. Coming up next week is a double episode where I'll be talking with Hannah Ellis from Bright Star and Michael Kilgore from Motown the Musical. The three of us all did a musical reading several years back, and so it's been great to watch their career soar since we did that reading together. And of course, don't forget the final five questions with Andrew Lippa coming up in the next episode. If you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I loved being a part of it, then I would be most grateful if you would share this episode with at least one person who you think could benefit from these types of conversations. I'm your host, Patrick Oliver-Jones, and let's get together next time as we talk more about why I'll never make it. <laughs>